A very good evening to all of you. And uh, my name is Dr. Sujit Kumar Puset. I have uh, associated with this institute and uh, I have been editing this magazine called Purpoda. So on behalf of the institute, Institute of Social and Cultural Studies, I welcome every single participant and all the distinguished uh, speakers over here. Uh, as we know, Purpoda is a new like a scheme by the government of India with this uh, aim of uh, increasing the connectivity at the same time. It is also to ameliorate the regional disparities. As we know, the Indian growth story is incomplete without the development of eastern part of India. So balanced regional development and reduction of the regional disparities, these two features of the Purvodaya policy. Last month only, we launched a magazine called Purvodaya by the Honorable Minister of Education and Government of India, Sri Dharmendra Pudhanji. And we have been stressing on this point that the continuous discussions and debate around the issue of development of the eastern part of India will trigger the complete economic development of India. So today we are in the cusp of the new economic generation or the new generation of economic reforms. So the focus is on the economic development. At the same time, taking the benefits of economic reforms, economic growth to the doorstep of the common people. So this has been the prime focus of the Purbodaya policy of government of India. As we know, connectivity has been an important factor in bringing in development. And the lack of connectivity is not only impacts everyday life and livelihoods, but also the regional development and the national security as well. The poor state of transport infrastructure and regional connectivity has serious uh, adverse implications for trade, uh, tourism, trade, uh, commerce, and the livelihood, etc. So the moment we speak about the growth story of India, it will definitely be incomplete without the development of the eastern part of India. So connectivity has been given importance in Purpada. So improvements in uh, connectivity will trigger the economic development, connectivity in terms of road, railways, and in terms of the benefits to the common people. It will benefit the entire region part of India. And it will also usher in a new investment in tourism, industry, agriculture, education, and the blue economy, etc. Recently, the government of India has launched the Satat, that is the Sustainable Alternative Towards Affordable Transportation, which is aimed at providing a sustainable alternatives towards affordable transportation as a development effort that would benefit uh, both vehicle users as well as the farmers and entrepreneurs. In recent years, the uh, government of India has also increased the rail connectivity. The entire Northeast region has been converted to the broad gauge network. Recently, the railway minister also laid stress of the Khurda Balangir, Haridaspur Talchir in Odisha. At the same time, Sikkim is expected to get the rail connectivity with the rest of India by the year 2023. So we see the Sevoke and Rankpo in West Bengal and Sikkim that the railway line is set to become operational in very short uh, span. Next is uh, Government of India's new uh, the policy initiative has been the Bharat Mala Puri Yojana, which is stressing on the road connectivity. So we have seen that the under Pradhan Mantri Gram Sada Rajana also, the road length has been increased in almost all states, Odisha, West Bengal, Bihar, Jharkhand, they have been given priorities. So another milestone is also in terms of connectivity, is the very popular scheme called the UDA. So connectivity and economic development go in hand and hand in hand. And the common people get the most benefit. So taking the benefit of economic progress, which impact the life of people, so these economic interventions, it has remained the top priority of the government of India. So Purbodha has been one of the big policy initiatives, uh, which has started making big changes in the lives of people in the eastern part of India. Uh, so far, the theoretical modelings are concerned. Uh, we have seen in the same times that uh, there is a strong correlation uh, between economic progress as well as connectivity. Uh, one study uh, by the Price Factor Coopers in 2016 it estimates that one dollar spent on infrastructure in Canada it increased the GDP in long term by between uh, 2.46 dollar to 3.83 dollar. So we generally see that there is a strong correlation in terms of connectivity of infrastructure, and there are many evidence also. So evidence abounds elsewhere on the positive effect of connectivity of infrastructure on the economy, even at the micro level, at the micro scale. So in a very short uh, term, the impact of investment in connectivity of infrastructure, there will be 
medium and long term effects as well. So this will strengthen the foundation of future economic growth, including uh, the labor markets. It will make the labor markets more efficient, productive, and it will also reward the labor market. So the Buddha scheme has agenda in terms of bringing out, uh, bringing in many rapid changes in economic development at the same time, changing the lives of people in the eastern part of India. So Prabhupada's aim is to complete the Indian. So today we have a very distinguished panel of experts here. Uh, the policy dialogue on improving connectivity in eastern India, the vision of Prabhupada by the Institute of uh, Social and Cultural Studies, Kolkata. It aims to bring out the various important dimensions of improving the connectivity under the Purbodhya. We welcome all the distinguished speakers over here. Dr. Rasmidas will moderate the session. We welcome Dr. Nihar Naik. We also welcome all distinguished speakers, Swini Naik, then Mr. Ganguly. And with this word, let me once again take a very warm welcome to all our distinguished speakers and our participants as well. So right now I request uh, Dr. Rasmi Das to moderate the session. Uh, Ma'am, you need to, sorry for interrupting, you need to switch up, put your microphone. Yes. Uh, very good evening to all of you uh, at ISCS, uh, to Dr. Sajid Kumar, uh, my younger brother Arindya Mukherjee, who runs the institute very, very efficiently, and we're very proud of you that ISCS has become a very important think tank in the eastern part of our country and doing a lot of enormous research work, original research work, which really helps policy making. Uh, so thank you for doing all that work. And our guest speakers, our panelists on this panel, um, Dr. Nihar Nayak, uh, Sri Arnab Ganguly, and Tohini Nayak. Uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, panel conversation discussion. Uh, today, which we are discussing basically, as the previous speaker has uh, elaborated, of out improving connectivity in Eastern India and the vision of Purvodaya. Of course, there are many uh, dimensions which have been mentioned in the concept note, and a lot of stats have also been provided, very methodically written concept note, uh, which itself can be a good standalone public uh, article in any publication. But today I would like to inquire from the our panelists, our guests on the panel, two, three things which the pandemic has really thrown up. And that is something also which we should discuss. And I think the concept note also needs to take that on board. Because when we are talking in terms of the Bharat Mala for Yojana, the most ambitious project. Uh, for connecting the eastern part of India, especially with a big focus towards the northeast, for its physical integration into the country and physical in integration is a prerequisite for the emotional and the security integration of that part of our country with the mainland. So it's very important that we understand this today in this conversation. Now, because of the pandemic, multiple waves of pandemic, the Bharat, uh, Bharat Mala projections have gone pretty haywire. It was supposed to be completed in 2022. The dateline is now pushed to 2026. And uh, the outlay was there have been cost overruns also. Uh, it, originally, it was five and a half lakh crores. Now it is eight and a half lakh crores. Of course, we have very capable. We have a very capable government, and they have done a big uh, plan for public-private partnerships, and they've gotten all kinds of models. BOT model on the whole basis, they have the MOT model, they have an SPV. So they, all the things which are needed to be done at the policy level are there. In spite of that, because of this unforeseen pandemic, uh, we've had this huge challenge of datelines being pushed. And Bharat Mala Part 2 is in the planning stage. It will be in the planning stage from 2022. This project has to get off really well for the northeast, for the corridors to be built in the eastern part of our country, and for the connectivity to be really meaningful. Because when connectivity in that part happens, the mega connectivity, the arterial connectivity happens, the feeder routes, the inter-corridor networks, all will be developed. But everything depends on the progress and, and implementation of this project, which now we are told it will be completed only in 2026. So how do our panelists look at 
first the first question which I would ask them to consider. Of course, they will make their own points, but they would I would like to know from them how would they consider this delay to impact the connectivity uh, the connectivity ratios in northeast part of our country. How would it impact the pushing back of schedules of Bharat Mala? How would it impact the connectivity of the northeast? Uh, second. What are the professions? What are the uh, what are the industries they foresee will be coming up in a major way in the northeast after the Bharat Mala project or Yojana project is implemented? This eastern uh, connectivity once it is established, what are the industries they think will come up in this area? What are the manpower planning that requires to be done? So that these industries which come up in these areas are ensured of a steady stream of manpower. So these are the few questions which I have opening questions which I would like uh, the panelists, the same panelists to consider when they make their points. And if we could focus ourselves on only discussing, keeping ourselves on the topic of improving connectivity in Eastern India, that would be very helpful. For the delegations going forward, so I would uh, begin with uh, Dr. Nihar Nayak. Could you please address us and let us know about your thoughts? About what do you think should be done in the present context? Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my sincere thanks to uh, ISCS for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak on uh, such an important uh, and uh, uh, timely uh, topic uh, and it's a very uh, new concept because uh, so far we have been discussing about northeast region and development in the northeast region but this is a something new region has been identify, identified by government of india that is uh, purva uh, eastern india uh, okay uh, but i will start basically as uh, chair suggested to focus on basically the region development issues and economic uh, and trade issues i'll slightly go beyond that i'll slightly cross the boundary i'll give basically what are the basically viewpoints or perspectives of two of our neighboring countries in fact and a third country i'm not including here the bangladesh how do they say how do they see this uh, project of uh, government of india uh, as uh, dr sujit mentioned about the two objectives of this uh, program uh, i would like to add one more objective in that that is basically the entire uh, uh, program is basically developed in such a way basically to supplement india's uh, neighborhood first policy and uh, regionalism sub regionalism because if you see the region has been uh, located in such a way it is a emerged as a tri junction in terms of uh, culture, in terms of economy, in terms of development, uh, also in terms of the cooperation in the disaster management, also. Uh, because in our neighborhood policy, when you uh, develop any kind of infrastructure in our neighborhood, uh, basically that is also we believe that, that uh, all those infrastructure will be perhaps utilized by uh, our neighboring countries. Uh, that is the reason because Prime Minister Modi uh, has been uh, frequently. I mentioned about like Sapka Saath, Sapka Bikas, and Sapka Sayog. And our entire neighborhood policy is mostly guided by these uh, uh, three uh, policies, basically, uh, to taking our neighbor, neighbors uh, together. Uh, and this is our neighbors, uh, particularly two Himalayan regions, Nepal and Bhutan, have been very much uh, a part of our, uh, uh, basically, uh, development uh, projects in the eastern uh, region. Uh, before coming to that, what are their viewpoint? Uh, so far on this uh, why government of india is focusing on uh, eastern zone i would like to identify so briefly about the strength of that region particularly the eastern part as uh, where government of india has identified uh, five provinces uh, mostly it is uh, this area is a mineral rich region 80% uh, of uh, basically iron ore and 100% uh, cooking coal and the cultural uh, similarities with nepal bhutan and bangladesh Six major seaports, if we uh, take uh, add uh, like uh, uh, seaports in Myanmar and uh, Bangladesh. Otherwise, uh, in eastern flank of India, we have a four dedicated already active seaports are there and two more seaports are about to come in uh, next uh, three, four years time. Then we have a very strong road and railway connectivity, all those uh, port areas. Uh, and there is also, as I said, it's a, 
is a meeting point between trilateral highways, Asian highways, BBIN, motor vehicle agreement is coming up in that region. Also, if you include the BCIM, it has been controversial project so far, but if are, so this is coming to a very important region that for that. And the tourism from the Nepalese point of view is a tourism sector because they can get Hindu tourists and the Buddhist tourists. Uh, and most importantly, this uh, growth project, the scheme may emerge as a major uh, project basically to countering China's BRI project in the eastern part of India, which is part of exactly they are trying to bring that BCIM part of the BRI in that. So this is basically a, going to be a connectivity, focus on the connectivity, trade, and market these are the key focus area in this uh, uh, in this region so here questions comes then how would this nepal and bhutan they will take all this um, sabo the sorry purbo the uh, project uh, and second question comes will the connectivity network which is coming off as a uh, eastern india uh, we facilitate in a matter of trade and sub regionalism what are the challenges before all those uh, programs and uh, how to reconcile between I mean, traditionally, India has been concerned about its security concerns, particularly in the Siluguri corridor. How to reconcile with India's security dilemma and the developmental aspirations of Nepal and Bhutan? So, these are the basically uh, key uh, questions I may a little bit uh, briefly discuss on this uh, my presentation. So, what are the significance of this connectivity network from uh, Nepal and Bhutan? Number one, obviously, it is provides basically multilateral platform because these are smaller countries and weak state. And they believe in basically uh, multilateral forums and arrangements, basically to strongly put forward their demands and negotiate strongly with uh, big countries like India. Second, it's a wide-ranging options. It gives wide-ranging options. They all these network uh, connectivity networks, basically to access seaports uh, beyond India. Like they can access Bangladesh. They can back out go to Myanmar, even the Thailand, up to Vietnam. They can reach to use them you know, for their transit, uh, their transit trade. Then uh, it also. Uh, gives basically a uh, affordable, a faster, and seamless cargo movement, like uh, with basically a multi, uh, multiple transit corridors, like all the, the entire eastern flank uh, is available to them. And there will be no loading, unloading kind of activities required in, in, case, in case the framework comes under the BBIN, because BBIN is a big platform which is emerging in this region. And, uh, and the most important advantage for both the countries, basically, without zero investment, uh, like investing in infrastructure corridor, uh, they, they can have a, a utilize all those dedicated uh, uh, upcoming in infrastructure in this region. And uh, the most uh, another important factor is basically big uh, the, in the entire eastern region, as because of the cultural contiguity, cultural uh, factor, and the geographical contiguity. Uh, there, they, for uh, Bhutan and Nepal, this is a big and immediate market. Uh, so, so they, they have to take advantage, uh, take advantage of, of that. Uh, having said that, I would like to say that at the same time, well, connectivity, as uh, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sujit said, that uh, India's growth is uh, uh, is not possible uh, if the eastern flank of uh, the India is not uh, not to be will not be developed properly. Then, similarly, I can say that obviously, if the government of India will not take along these are two neighbors, obviously the, the entire development programs will not be completed. But at the same time, these two smaller countries have a lot of anxiety over particular related to connectivity programs. What are those anxiety of these two uh, smaller countries? Number one, from the Bhutanese point of view, when government of India or any programs coming under the BBIN, they find the two things how to reconcile between ecology, economy, and security. From the Nepalese point of view, how to reconcile between uh, that Belt and Road Initiative, which is offered by China since 2013 onwards, then Millennium Challenge Corporation offered by US government and the BBIN. So they have to reconcile uh, between these, you know, basically major pro programs being offered by three major uh, countries, uh, which are uh, very much active in the Himalayan region. Uh, coming to the last part of my uh, presentation, what are the challenges? And uh, uh, will the connectivity network facilitate regional integration? Uh, obviously, there are a couple of challenges are still existing and government of India, unless government of India address those challenges, uh, uh, I think in a short, in a, in a, in a particular, uh, in, a, in a stipulated uh, time, a particular time frame, then perhaps uh, the entire program, maybe North System Development Program or this Food Brother Program may not be beneficial to our neighboring countries. Also, government of India may not take advantage of, you know, basically this soft power uh, in, 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 in our neighborhood. Number one, our passenger protocol 
basically act which is yet to be particular motor vehicle agreement on the BBIN and the cargo protocol motor vehicle agreement yet to be uh, ratified, yet to be uh, clarified. Then uh, the BBIN and motor vehicle agreement is silent on transit trade. That's the one which will be part of this uh, uh, growth corridor in the eastern part. Then bottlenecks are still there uh, related to the non-tariff uh, non non uh, barriers. Then quality of roads in that region, particularly connecting Nepal, Bangladesh, and Bhutan, Bangladesh is uh, still is in a very um, bad uh, bad shape. And uh, uh, the last uh, uh, one important particular which we have to understand the requirement of Nepal and Bhutan. What are the requirement of Nepal and Bhutan related to the connectivity? One is what Nepal recently trying to basically transforming its remittance based economy to basically and aid based economy to basically investment economy and export oriented economy. So for that, uh, Nepal requires basically a um, basically need basically multiple faster and seamless transit corridor by whether by road or uh, railway connectivity, then connecting with international rail links uh, by uh, accessing Bangladesh or Myanmar or any other part of uh, other countries in this region, then transmission lines to export is electricity. That's a major concern for Nepal. And for the Bhutan, basically a smaller economy, they are exactly the similar, same, a similar line, basically transforming their economy to basically aid-based economy to investment economy. And they are focusing more on the green economy, which is going to be a focus area uh, in, in, in upcoming uh, days. So, and, and the most importantly, in the, from the Bhutanese part of, they are trying to basically is continue with their self basically imposed uh, image that basically not to identify with the India side or the China side. So these are the challenges are going to be very much there in there. And most importantly, two more points I'd like to say and conclude that after that. One is the trust, trust deficit. Despite uh, India emerging as a big country and so many development projects are coming in the eastern region, there is a serious trust deficit is there between India, Nepal, India, Bhutan, and India, Bangladesh. Unless government of India address the trust deficit, whether it's emerging because of the bilateral issues, maybe the uh, all the maybe because of international issues, this India is taking along this never uh, the program, uh, uh, the initiative will not be uh, completed. And the last point I would like to mention here that a disaster re resilient infrastructure, whatever infrastructure government of India is bringing out, whether the port, railway, connectivity, or bridge, all should be, all those uh, infrastructure should be disaster re resilient infrastructure, otherwise, because this is a highly disaster prone area. Mm -hmm. So all, otherwise, the development, uh, the growth uh, of, you know, of this uh, thing will not be uh, completed. And the last point is that the BRI, the BRI offering which is low interest projects to Bangladesh, Nepal, and Bhutan. So government of India has to frame its policy accordingly to targeting how to counter BRI in this region. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll just I'd like to take any question and any comments uh, after, after this session. Thank you. How about you, ma'am? Uh, may I? Yes, ma'am. Uh, there was uh, under Mission Purvo, they are the integrated uh, Calcutta, is suppo Kolkata, rather, is supposed to be the, the integrate hub for the integrate integrated steel hub in the eastern India. It's yeah. one of the major objectives of Purvo there. Yeah. So, uh, if that is achieved, if that target is achieved, it would also uh, help uh, all these countries, neighboring countries in the east on our eastern flank, yeah. Bangladesh, Nepal, and Bhutan, because any development, any construction activity requires a steel. And if, if it is sourced from Kolkata, Kolkata being the hub, becoming the hub, it is it, it, that is what is planned, that Kolkata becomes the hub of the integrated steel, uh, integrated steel plan. And uh, even the 75% incremental need of our country also can be met from this Eastern, Eastern hub. So not only does it serve uh, the neighbors, but it becomes the main source for India uh, as a whole. So that's a huge economic opportunity for the eastern part of India also because uh, those are those, those are the eastern belt of our country is the place where the iron is the traditional iron belt of our country. Yes. Uh, so how do you see that uh, helping in the development uh, of Purvodhya? Um, um, the steel push in the eastern India under mission Purvodhya. Okay, no, actually, uh, see, this uh, uh, um, the Purva project actually offers uh, say basically uh, uh, 
will uh, um, be basing of offering jobs around 2.5 million people is basically this region and this region traditionally if you see the human development index, index in the region is very low if you compare with uh, uh, north india or even the uh, western india or the south india this region has been you know, despite uh, several development programs are coming out coming in this region for last uh, seven to eight uh, years still it is human development index is very low so if this people will 2.5 million people will be benefited they will be getting jobs so definitely economically this region will grow and this uh, uh, as i said that this uh, if you um, even as a steel hub so this uh, dedicated already active ports will be used as a basically exporting this iron ore iron uh, steel whatever finished products or maybe the raw material to basically uh, other countries and third also uh, bhutan and nepal these are basically Uh, as a developing countries and they require huge uh, amount of you no know, infrastructure like in terms of in nepal particularly they did large number of hydro projects because their uh, potential of uh, they have uh, actually hydro potential of of, of, uh, of around uh, 40000 megawatts so, so far they have generated only 2000 megawatt hydro power so around 38 for the around 38000 uh, megawatt they need huge infrastructure hydro infrastructure so they need iron been finished uh, iron uh, product Uh, to do, do to develop all those uh, projects so similarly the road construction even the railway connectivity railway projects in nepal also is a big project similarly the bhutan has also more than 20000 uh, hydro um, hydro mega um, hydro, hydro project uh, uh, requirement i mean uh, they they can produce so the steel hub in that kolkata region can basically supply all those you no know, requirement of all those uh, developing countries stuff and uh, the second is basically the coal i don't know the thermal coal is going down because of the under the climate change programs mm -hmm. but still it can be utilized in a different way maybe some new technology can be used and maybe used particular in the energy um, producing uh, particular producing energy uh, for basically supplying industries uh, in those areas so i see it is a big uh, it has a huge potential but i as i said that the climate change unless most of the development projects whatever road connectivity whatever railway connectivity whatever bridge is coming up unless or passing through different industrial corridors all the way from uh, orissa to jharkhand chatisgarh even the northern part of andhra pradesh see these areas are highly uh, basically vulnerable to climate uh, climatic uh, disasters so unless we need a very infrastructure in basically resilient infrastructure this region will continue under this you no know, poverty and under development forever okay okay uh, may i now please invi invite uh, our next panelist shri arnab ganguly and request him to make his presentation yes mr ganguly thank Gangu. you so much <clears throat> thank you so much uh, ms das chair and uh, all a uh, very good uh, very good evening to all the pa participants and the speakers here uh thanks to iec iscs for having me here uh the <clears throat> you know uh, i would like to thank uh, dr naik to kind of uh, you know giving such a uh, very good exposition of the of the things that uh, <clears throat> that should be considered uh, from the connectivity point of view now when we are talking about purvodaya uh, basically it's it's uh, trying to you know strengthen the eastern region of uh, india and uh, we had uh, and we have a comparative advantage in the steel iron and steel production and uh, the purvodaya is definitely going to think them that uh, but at this point in time i would also like to mention that purvodaya should not be uh, considered as a stand alone project it should be also considered along with projects like uh, uh, the gati shakti the bharat mala which you mentioned also the sagar mala mm -hmm. because all these projects are actually targeted to bring the countries in the bpi in region closer to each other and especially enhance our connectivity with the northeast india mm -hmm. because northeast india is extremely important from a security point of view <clears throat> now having said that you know if we uh, you know if we look at bangladesh and that's what i will more focus on uh, if you are talking about looking at bangladesh bangladesh is a kind of a good uh, huge consumer of iron iron and steel they are also they are also investing in strengthening their own iron and steel capacities 
we we think that covid had kind of uh, helped before covid most of the iron and steel the btmt bars etc they used to you know go either via road or through railways the covid actually triggered the use of waterways which is also an impetus to the purvodaya scheme of course there are a lot of things that need to be done to you know improve our uh, inland waterway uh, transport uh, when it especially when it comes to freight movement so a lot of structure infrastructural facilitations required process related facilitations are required but i would rather not you know uh, get into that and rather uh, i would i would focus on how purvodaya can actually uh, purvodaya scheme and bangladesh they can kind of <clears throat> create a synergy for uh, each, each other and there could be some areas of uh, symbiotic growth now if we look at bangladesh bangladesh is right now one of the fastest growing economies in this region and lot of construction lot of developments are happening especially in the northern bangladesh both in the northwest and in the northeast why because you know there was a concerted effort and a conscious effort from the government to develop these areas because they were mostly you know backward uh, they had a high poverty ratio low literacy rates and so the the one of the important things that the government did is to you know start uh, planning to set up export processing zones in this region the export processing zone at nilfamari uh, is is uh, you know it had a tremendous impact on the local economy similarly there are a lot of infrastructure development happening at maiman singh mm. at sirajganj the podda bridge is coming up a lot of roads bridges etc are going to be you know are, are are coming up so in a way these will absorb lot of iron and steel and of course the the purvodaya scheme will be and you know give that additional impetus to help them. uh along with the other schemes as i said the bharat mala the uh, the the uh, gati shakti and all those stuff now what will happen if uh, you know now if if you if you look at also you know you know uh, if you look at bangladesh and we consider the modal share you know bulk of the trade almost 80% of the freight moved via roadways what india is also trying to do is you know enter into a motor vehicles agreement with uh, with the government of bangladesh and nepal and you know things are uh, moving right now you know in the right direction and so governments have you know renewed that focus on and they are working on the on the scope of uh, of of you know the 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 sops of the the dvi and nda now having uh, you know with the once this road uh, infrastructure is strengthened it will ease up is the pressure from the siliguri corridor and it will kind of uh, help connecting india and the northeast india via bangladesh in this regard the uh, if we have if you are talking about you know if if we if, if i uh, you know look at the uh, purvodaya scheme and the northeast india via via bangladesh you know one thing that comes to my mind could be the ship building industry in the northeast mm -hmm. maybe bangladesh and the northeast they can complement each other in the ship building industry that's one area the second uh, and that has been you know we have been kind of pushing this thing bangladesh exports lot of processed food items and uh, the and many of the uh, fruits fresh fruits vegetables you know they are grown in the northeast so in those terms if the the food processing sector in the northeast and bangladesh they can complement each other but they are not you know not related to the uh, purvodaya scheme as such uh, also if you look at northeast <clears throat> there are you know northeast had a lot of uh, iron and steel activities going on but unfortunately they were you know that didn't uh, were not kicking off many of the of the industries had to be you know closed down for that uh so you know it's like so you know uh, uh 
sorry, I just lost. Yeah. So mostly what I'm, I'm trying to tell is Purvadaya scheme will help integrate India with Bangladesh better because the the output, the the uh, the products, you know, in in the Eastern India will act as uh, raw materials in Bangladesh and help them grow. In terms, Bangladesh can help the Northeast India grow through better connectivity and through you know this kind of a symbiotic uh, a symbiotic uh, relation can happen. Also, Northeast, uh, you know, they they also have a good cement industry. Uh, demand, so I'm sorry, demand for cement industry, which is supplied mostly by Bangladesh. Now, you know, coming to the political economy side of it, when it's connectivity, it's not only the central government who is making the who is who is taking the decisions. It with the local political economy. The Gati Shakti scheme is a framework. The Purvadaya is a framework, but the states will have to implement it. Now, the bigger challenge is: Are the states aligned with the center in implement? I'm, I'm not talking about political ideologies. Are they aligned in terms of uh, implementing the the the, pro, the scheme in the good spirit? That's one. The second, you know, when we are talking about roadways. We are actually talking about a lot of informal exchanges happening between two parties. It's not possible for railways or waterways to you know, accommodate those kind of informal exchanges. Now, the thing is, uh, so, you know, Purvadaya scheme via road is good, but do Bangladesh has that kind of road infrastructure? My experience is congestion is one of the biggest challenges, let alone the quality of roads. I'll not get into that. The biggest challenge is the congestion. Now, it ha you know, is it possible to address that? It's it's very difficult, uh, you know, to put it very simply and bluntly, because the road lobby, both in India and Bangladesh, they are very strong. Uh, even if we look at, say, for ex example, in uh, India, if we talk about the, uh, you know, Holdia port, if you look at the, the board of directors, they have people from railways, they have people from roadways. And, you know, they are taking the call. It's not so much the, the people from Haldia Port, they don't have much say on that. So, uh, you know, I would I would like to um, stop at this. And uh, but before that, just wanted to, you know, kind of share one small thing. Uh, we had a lot of schemes. We had a lot of infrastructure. For example, we had the ICP subroom. Uh, in, in Tripura, which was supposed to facilitate trade between Chittagong and Northeast. But, you know, even after opening of this ICP subroom, the completion of the Moitri Setu, hardly any cargo has moved along that route. So it doesn't matter whether we are looking at Purvadaya, we are looking at some other scheme, we are talking about Gati Shakti or whatever. Are we aligned? Are all the countries aligned and they have the good intention of implementing uh, the these schemes and are the state governments ready to facilitate that kind of uh, synergy i'll i'll stop at here thanks thank you for your exposition it was very informed a whole lot of points uh, may i just say something uh, yeah, please. Yeah, based on your exposition you picking on your last point you're saying that in spite of the infrastructure, physical infrastructure being there, we're not seeing cargo movement on that part of on, on those stretches. So why is that happening country to country? Is it a, is a tax structure an impediment or uh, preferences of people, buying preferences of people? What is it that prevents the cargo movement if the physical structure, infrastructure is in place? Uh, uh, if you look at the Northeast India, especially Tripura, uh, specifically, if you look at the ICP Agartala, you know Agartala is significant because there is the now there is the rail connectivity which which will be operational soon between Akhauda and Akshugans. Mm. Even that happens, commodities will not move. Why? Because you know there are a lot of restrictions in, you know imposed by the Bangladesh part. Because there are only, if I'm not wrong, only 29 commodities I think were allowed to go into Bangladesh from this port. 
so this port restriction is one one thing the other thing is are we selecting the consumption and the production points wisely uh to the actually you know the before we actually plan the logistics we are planning uh, you know an icp in sabroom in tripura but what has tripura to offer yeah so you know those kind of things are uh, you know questions that we should be you know considering we should be looking into more closely mm -hmm. infrastructure so, i would say sorry i mean the infrastructure i would say is you know developing like anything mm -hmm. and but then you know are the commodities and the people are they moving along those roads because if they don't move then military will mm -hmm. so whatever infrastructure junctions are put up they have to be aligned aligned with the commodity structure the commodity yes. interface and and the preferences basically the commodity preferences and what is allowed you said 29 items only allowed from our part of the our side to bangladesh side so yes. there are a whole lot of quantitative restrictions also as to what yes. can go in to bangladesh yes. so those are the issues i think which a bi bilateral kind of negotiations have to look at Uh, for the infrastructure to be really, really be taken advantage of, and well, well-being and economic prosperity coming to people in that part of our world. Yes, yes. And if I may just add one last point. So you know, Tripura, you know, having this ICP uh, at Tripura and connecting connectivity with Sabroom would have made more sense had the BBI and MBA in place, because then you know this Purvadaya scheme would have been more. Uh, fruitful the cargoes would have move, uh, moved more you know in a better way because from west bengal to tripura and then to uh, to northern bangladesh and all those part but that's not happening yeah i'll stop i think so may i now invite uh, our uh, third panelist and our youngest panelist i suppose uh, to speak to us on this uh, topic so welcome uh, shoini can you please make your presentation Yes, thank you so much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Shohini Nayak, and I'm presently working as a junior fellow at Observer Research Foundation. And I would sincerely like to thank uh, the Institute of uh, Social and Cultural Studies, India, for this platform and this opportunity. Now, um, to begin with, uh, uh, Mission Purvadaya is a very, uh, you know, a very dynamic and a robust initiative by the government of India. that has been keenly observed at the global platform and as we already know the project has begun with an integrated steel hub uh, the proposal encompassing odisha jharkhand chatisgarh west bengal and northern andhra pradesh like such uh, serving as a like sort of a torch bearer if i can say so for socio economic development of eastern india and the project apart from being just a hub for the development of a steel plant or an integrated steel hub may also you know uh, carry within itself several opportunities that can take india further ahead to better participation in the wider global arena as well as wider multilateral platforms and in this regard i would primarily focus on the relevance of northeast india and how india can particularly use this domain Uh, which is a very crucial domain in bringing about synergies of cooperation with other countries as well as other dynamic platforms now uh, to begin with uh, northeast india is a home to about uh, 3.8% of the indian population and it also covers 5300 kilometers of international border and uh, india has been viewing this area from the perspective of increasing investments through transnational connectivity particularly with bangladesh myanmar and thailand and the northeast region presents a trillion dollar economic opportunity that can be enhanced with better transportation border infrastructure e-commerce integration and modernized cross border supply chains all of which at the moment are unrealized yet the government is working you know uh, to bring about a better generation of uh, uh, initiatives in this region and if this potential is tapped then the indian policy makers expect that the country's exports will pick up that more investments will flow in 
and that regional integration will serve as a positive springboard for greater global economic interdependence. And uh, this is how the Northeastern states will internationalize India's hinterland economy through maritime as well as cross-border hubs on the eastern coast with Bangladesh and Myanmar. And uh, since we are talking about Northeast India, and uh, and as we know, and if I may mention here, that uh, the Northeast is historically, uh, it has remained marginalized. And we know that this is uh, due to the local insurgencies and uh, the fact that the connectivity projects had not developed there for a very long period of time. And this remoteness can be, you know, uh, gotten rid of through projects like the Purvodaya, where the center can actually link the Northeast through West Bengal and Kolkata can actually serve as a Lingazo city. And since we are talking about the eastern part of India and Northeast, we cannot leave behind the opportunities that are presented by the Bay of Bengal. Okay, and consequently, we have to mention multilateral platforms like the BIMSTEC, you know, that can play an active role in uh, fanning out Mission Purvodaya through the, the entire Northeast and right across to the wider ASEAN countries moving from the South Asian part of the world to the Southeast Asian part of the world. And uh, the Northeast borders four BIMSTEC countries, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, and Myanmar. And uh, this is the reason why the Northeast has, you know, primarily become a key cog in regional cooperation. And it has been often regarded as a gateway between the two pillars of the Indian foreign policy, neighborhood first and the Act East policy. And uh, we might as well portray uh, the idea of Atmanirbhar Bharat philosophy here as well, because as we move towards the, you know, the domain of India towards the Southeast, we, you know, uh, invite more investments and better industries and uh, in the in the in the 2021 bimstick foreign ministers meeting the indian external affairs minister s j shankar you know alluded to this very necessity as a paradigm shift along with uh, you know lines of a legal framework that uh, you know needs to be brought about for intense for, for cooperation and regional integration which will help india to grow into a you know an approximately 5 trillion dollar economy and this is why BIMSTIC with ASEAN can you know, bring about the, 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 the best of the Northeast, if I can say so, as a logistical linchpin. And in this regard, India has also linked its uh, you know, Sagarmala project, which is a port-led development project, and transnational maritime security projects in Northeast for trade and tourism and people-to-people -people connectivity. And uh, in this regard, uh, we may mention the India-Bangladesh protocol on inland water transport and trade you know, as a very important uh, case in point. And uh, as far as the Northeast is concerned, the government of India has been, you know, emphasizing on science and technology interventions in the Northeast as well. And uh, this is being uh, funded by the Ministry of Development of the Northeast region. And, you know, as we develop, as we identify rather more infrastructure and connectivity projects, we are actually, you know, looking at the Northeast as a kind of a trust area. And on similar lines, attempting to improve air connectivity, uh, water connectivity in the Northeast will actually make, uh, you know, will actually form a part of the BIMSTIC connectivity master plan. And this is how uh, the I feel the Purva Daya can move forward through the BIMSTIC as a leveraging platform, you know, as a springboard. And uh, we all know that uh, Japan has been a very dynamic partner for India in the Purva Daya plan. Okay. And uh, we must mention here that. Uh, uh, Japan has been intrinsically involved with India in the development of the Northeast since a very, very long time. And uh, there are several development projects in the country with which Japan has been very closely working uh, in India and uh, specifically in Northeast and the Northeast Road Connectivity Improvement Project. And through the Japan International Cooperation Agency uh, aims to ensure infrastructural developments in the Northeast to boost connectivity with countries like Bangladesh and Myanmar. And another example is the bridge between uh, Dhubri in Assam and Pulbari in Meghalaya, uh, which have been providing significant developments for, uh, you know, India-Japan relationship as well, and as well as improving regional connectivity and also bringing about connectivity with Bangladesh, with Bhutan through Dalu, which is in Meghalaya, and uh, also Hapi Sar in Assam on the India-Bhutan border via the Tura and Pulbari in Meghalaya region. So overall, 
the northeast road connectivity project has helped to you know upgrade transit infrastructure in the northeast and in 2020 japan has also provided an official development assistance loan for uh, of about 13.2 million dollars and uh, this kind of a social economic development package have been you know continuously being provided to india and uh, the i feel that mission purvadaya is also you know uh, in in the similar uh, league where the two countries are coming together so that india as a country can you know move forward uh, you know towards uh, the north, uh, towards the southeast and if india moves towards the southeast as my you know previous speakers had mentioned the countries that are around india you know the 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 neighbors of india that are you know very close to india and which are landlocked neighbors can you know also benefit from this kind of a development and uh, the you know this is all the more important because you know uh, the internal connectivity that is happening in northeast will also benefit the locals of the region that is very important and uh, this is how uh, not only the country will develop on a wider global platform but also in a more of a you know a local perspective will also be enhanced at the same time and uh, uh, one of the problems you know that um, i feel must be uh, uh, addressed in this juncture is the development of you know kind of a consensus among the partners who are working together in the larger perspective so once there is you know the generation of consensus and people you know actually come together and work together for example uh, the bbin has not been able to be successful since a very very long time now so we have to understand why it has not been able to be successful so i think that all the countries the partner countries are not on the same page so if the partner countries are not on the same page i think connectivity projects beyond uh, bilateral mechanisms can never be successful you know because we have to bring about rationalization harmonization of collaborative policies and across the neighbors the rules and laws of the region you know so that we can bring about the complementarities uh, that exist and so uh, if we cannot be on the same page we cannot uh, Uh, you know unleash the maximum potential for development and uh, for this reason it is important that you know all the neighboring countries come together especially if i'm talking about more of a multilateral platform then uh, i think um, india can definitely play a, play a very proactive role you know and all uh, and and uh, the bbin countries and the bimstek countries more or less all the countries are you know the, the the they are in the same multilateral uh, framework you know some countries of the bbin are also in the bimstek and uh, the the bay of bengal is one integrated zone so once all these countries can bring about sort of a consensus generation along with definitely a kind of a very calm situation in the northeast which the government of course is attempting uh, i think that uh, Uh, the missions like purvodaya can be more successful otherwise you know the problem with connectivity projects i feel is they begin they begin you know with you know full you know pomp and glory but then what happens is sometimes down the line you know the countries they fail to communicate with each other and that is why you know somewhere down the line there is stagnation in the process so as uh, you know uh, my chair had mentioned previously that uh, why the delay so i think one of the primary reasons for this delay is the lack of consensus generation and the fact that all these countries they sometimes cannot move beyond the bilateral mechanism when it is the multilateral setup sometimes they fail to you know identify the pros and cons of uh, a group mechanism altogether so i think that uh, mission purvodaya can definitely be successful in the long run because india has the support of partner countries like japan which is very important plus it has a very important springboard like the bimstek and the bay of bengal and india is in a very advantageous position but india must you know strive to take into confidence the 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 priorities of the neighbors as well so once that is done i think uh, uh, you know connectivity projects and steel hubs or developmental infrastructural projects can be you know more successful more uh, you know a uh, it can move beyond what it is now okay so um, i rest my case here <laughs> so that was from my end thank you thank you shoni for that very energetic uh, exposition it was a very detailed very statistically rich 
presentation that you made. Thank you for your words. Uh, two things which I would like to say before, uh, because uh, and, uh, we are nearly at the end of our time. So this and two very important keywords, which I have two, three keywords, which have emerged from this uh, hour long panel discussion is, uh, of course, all the more or less, all the panelists are agreed uh, on a few points which is that uh, Mission Pohodaya is a great idea. It has a lot of promise, and it means a lot of economic prosperity for the region. But of course, it is also premised on two parallel networks, two multilateral networks working very well as a very well-oiled machinery. One is the BBIN, and another is the BIMSTIC, which are hamstrung by certain bilateral uh, movements uh, which have uh, uh, entered into us either into a stalemate zone or they have not been able to move forward uh, so that has been a limiting clearly a limiting factor so that needs to be resolved uh, there should be first an acceptance that there is a kind of a no movement zone and then the negotiation should start for the movement head if that when that happens Purvo there will really get a very very strong fillip uh, so of that, there is uh, there is no doubt. Uh, one point which uh, Dr. Nehar Nayak uh, made very forcefully was about neighborhood anxieties. I think as a foreign policy uh, measure uh, and a principle, India should take it on board when it is uh, uh, about these neighbor how, about how to address these neighborhood anxieties over infrastructure projects. I think that's a point very well made. And the point which uh, Sri Anguli made is that our connectivity projects with uh, north within north with north in the northeast becomes very easy if Bangladesh comes on the same page with us. Uh, so how do we uh, partner more closely with Bangladesh on the economic front is something which governments have to uh, have to think about. Uh, and uh, uh, Shoni also made more or less, uh, Shoni also reiterated that with facts and figures that how these are very important layers, the BBIN, and the, in fact, those are the words which he used, the BBIN and the BIMSTEC are very important layers which for Purvodaya to really take off in a big way. Uh, so I would urge ISCS uh, to incorporate all these points uh, in their presentation to the policymakers that if Purvodaya is to be really pushed forward, then the multilateral arrangements that India has in the Near East and the neighborhood, they have to be integrated uh, with Mushan Purvodaya. And then only we can see the desired objectives. Uh, so I would hand, uh, hand over to Dr. Shujit for the conduct of the rest of the panel. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rashidas, for this uh, moderation of this dialogue. I think the policy dialogue on improving the connectivity in Eastern India, the vision of Purvodaya by the Institute of Social and Cultural Studies that aims to bring out the various uh, uh, important dimensions of this uh, very important policy of initiative of Government of India. It has certainly brought out the various important dy dimensions to this one. So various speakers, uh, right from Dr. Rasmidas, Dr. Nihar Naik, Sri Arnab Kanguli and Ms. Soini Naik, they brought out the most important aspect that the secure neighborhood also very important. So we convey our sincere thanks to the eminent uh, speakers over here. The deliberations uh, with multiple perspective, it has certainly enriched the discussions among the different speakers and it has also increased the policy input as well as the policy setting process so the institute conveys the sincere thanks to dr rasmidas for her uh, sparing her time and moderating the entire dialogue and uh, all the eminent speakers Ms. soini naik dr nihar naik and dr uh, of ganguly for their valuable comments and they will be that will be incorporated the entire deliberation will be uploaded very soon on the website of uh, uh, Institute very soon, and we convey sincere thanks to the director of the institute, Sri uh, Mr. Arinda uh, Mukherjee, and the program officer, Ms. Konkona Roy. So, with this, we come to the end of this policy dialogue and the deliberations on improving connectivity in Eastern India. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much to the elite audience as well. And we convey our best wishes for the Merry Christmas that's forthcoming and the New Year, prosperous New Year. 
thank you very much for being with us stay in touch and we'll next month we'll come up with another edition of purbode thank you very much thank you. bye